Good evening and welcome to our service tonight. Sorry about the technical hitches, gremlins and all sorts of things. But uh, thank you so much for joining us. It is lovely to have you with us. It is lovely to be able to join in this way and to be able to worship our God together. Let's open our service in a word of prayer this evening. Yes, Lord Jesus, we thank you for being able to come together. We thank you that even though we are in our own homes, even though we are not in one another's presence, Lord Jesus, you are here with us. And we want to thank you for that. And We want to ask that you would move in our midst that we would have a special feeling of your spirit with us tonight. That we might be blessed and that we would worship you and bless you in spirit and in truth this evening. Come Lord Jesus and take your place in the center this evening. Lord Jesus, that the worries and the cares of the day might be forgotten. And that our focus might be on you tonight. Amen. Before we start with our singing, I'd just like to remind you of our prayer text service. So you can see it's scrolling across the bottom of the screen at the moment. If you would like one of your messages to come up, please feel free to text even now on 07441908550. That will come directly through to Adam, who is waiting to be able to process them, and they'll come up onto the screen. We will be using those in prayer time later on. So I'd encourage you, if you're wanting to be part of the service and to be part of our community together, please feel free to send us a prayer request or a praise item that you would like us to include in the service this evening. We're going to open our service and remind ourselves that God is the way maker. He's a miracle worker. He's a promise keeper. We're going to sing Waymaker. It's a little bit of a new one, but uh, we've enjoyed it in the past, and it has an incredible amount of truth in it that we can rest in God's promises, and He is able to do more than we can even ask or imagine. I'd encourage you, if you're sitting, stand up. If you're standing, jump. Feel free to be part of the service this evening, and not just a spectator, but worship God yourself wherever you are. Let's sing and stand together. I worship you, 
I worship you. You are here, mending every heart. I worship you. I worship you. We make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. 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 Even when I don't see it. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. ourselves this evening of that promise that is who he is he is a way maker he is a miracle worker he is our promise keeper and he wants to work with us he wants to use us isn't it the most amazing thing the creator of the universe is willing and desperate to have a relationship with us and the way he's done that is by giving us jesus And by Jesus dying on the cross and cleansing us of our sins, Jesus is God's righteousness. The Son of Man, the Son of God, His kingdom come. Let's sing together.
God's holiness displayed. Now glorified, now justified, His kingdom comes, and His kingdom will know no end, and its glory shall know. is our last song as we come to our prayer time so don't forget if you're wanting to include anything in our prayer time please, please feel free the lines are open and we we're waiting to hear from you we're going to sing nothing but the blood of jesus a, an old hymn a good hymn and the truth nothing but the blood of jesus is what we need to come into god's kingdom
Jesus. I love that fourth verse. This is all my hope and peace. Isn't that amazing that in a time of such unrest, such chaos around us, that we can say all our hope and all our peace is in Jesus. Not something that comes from the world, not something that we have to work for, but in Jesus, and he freely gives it to us. We come to our time of prayer now. And let's remember that we can remember that despite what's going on, despite the uncertainty of jobs or uncertainty of health, all our hope, all our peace is in Jesus. I'm going to open in prayer and then we'll, we'll pray some of the prayers that have been coming in. Let's open our time of prayer. Yes, Lord Jesus, we thank you. That we don't have to work. In fact, there is nothing that we can do. We cannot earn our salvation. We cannot earn your peace. We cannot earn your hope. But you want to give it to us. And all we have to do is ask. Oh Lord Jesus, as we come to you in prayer now, we thank you. We have reminded ourselves you are a miracle working God. We have reminded ourselves that our hope can be in you. And so, Lord Jesus, we do that tonight as we come to you in prayer. That our eyes and our hearts would be fixed on you. And that nothing that happens around us, nothing that can happen to us, is out of your control. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Adam, would you lead us? Wendy Wright, church? please can we pray, can we all pray for the servicemen and women who are not only protecting us from terrorist attacks, but now also helping protect the civilian population from this devastating pandemic. Be with them, Lord, protect these brave men and women, some of whom are only in their late teens. Mm. And uh, I had the joy uh, just at the end of last week of sitting within safely three meters apart from Sean Ferguson, who is, is back in Girvan. Sean is the son of our very own Janice Ferguson. And, uh, and Sean is in the army now. And Sean was due to deploy to Afghanistan uh, real r just recently. He was supposed to be there now. But unfortunately, he's been sent home along with many in the army as the, the Afghans are all shut down and, and our army is all shut down. And it's, it's a difficult time for them because you can imagine if you're living in a barracks and close quarters, then, then the coronavirus is a, is a dangerous thing. So, so do pray for our service people, some of whom are living in tricky situations and others of whom are being called out to the front lines. Let's pray together. Lord our God, we do pray for, for the men and women of our armed forces who, who put themselves in harm's way, Lord God, for the sake of the peace of our country. And Father, we don't mean to say anything political by this, but we know that you love them. And we know that, that you wish your name to be known among them. So we pray for them, Lord, wherever they may be now, whether they be on deployment in foreign lands, whether they be at the, the pop-up testing stations around the country, whether they be helping with keeping order, whether they be on furlough at home or in the barracks, Lord, we ask that you would, you would bless them that you would draw near to them. And we pray that this would be a time that they would have to think and to reflect on life and its purpose and to reflect on you. Father, we pray for the chaplains in the various armed forces and the various services. We ask that at this time you would give them special wisdom and discernment. Give them words of hope and life, words of truth and love, that they may speak blessing into these men and women. Father, we pray that you would keep them and protect them as they seek to keep and protect us. Lord our God, we also pray for, for the many other emergency services workers who will be working in the front lines with them, the fire services, the police services, the, the coast guard and the lifeguard services, as well as, of course, the, the paramedics, the ambulance services and, and the NHS staff. Lord God, where would this country be without these people? And we thank you for their faithfulness. Lord, we recognize that so many of them are bearing a crushing load at the moment, working 
too long. Working under awful circumstances of fear, worried for their family, worried about bringing things home from the wards where they're working. So Lord our God, would you grant to them peace? Would you grant to them protection? Would you grant to them healing and strength to persevere through it all? Would you guard and protect their rest and refresh them each night, ready to face the day again? For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I would like, like to thank you for the prayers for my sister and her family. Um, she had a, a corona test on Sunday and it came back negative. She needs to have one more. She's going for that tomorrow. And if that comes back negative again, then she can go back to work. God has been good. She hasn't been suffering a huge number of symptoms. She says she's battling with a bit of tiredness, but that's it. And the rest of the family have all been negative. So God has been good, and he's been answering your prayers. So thank you so much for that. We were also talking to John a couple of days ago on the coffee morning, and he was saying that his sister-in-law is looking to get out of hospital as well fairly soon. So God has been good, and he is at work, and he is healing still even today. Let's bring these people before our God. Lord Jesus, we thank you for answers to prayer. We thank you for the miracles that we have seen even today of healing, of people being cured of this virus, of your provision of food and medical supplies and basic necessities that we've seen you give to Ron and Joanna and Tondo. Oh Lord Jesus, we could, <laughs> we could go all night of ways that you have blessed us and ways that you have been with us through this. So we give you all the praise and all the glory and honor tonight for being who you are, for being a God who provides, for being a God who protects, a God who heals, and a God who loves. We thank you so much, Father. Amen. Can I also add that I had a, a we message from Heather in India just this morning. Um, I was asking how she was doing and, and how her mom's doing. As you know, her, her mom was diagnosed with coronavirus. And Heather says that not only is she doing well, just keeping a low profile there in India, but managing. Uh, her mom is, is doing really well and seems to have come through and uh, is nearly, wow, she might already be at the end of her quarantine time. So she has, she has overcome the coronavirus and they're both doing really well. Let's give thanks. Lord our God, we thank you for the, this news. We thank you for, for Heather and her parents and the joy that they have brought into our fellowship. And even though they're not with us now, Lord God, we, we lift them up to you. Father, we pray for Heather over in India that you would guard her and keep her. Lord, we, we pray that you would bless her time cooped up in her apartment there, that you would make it to her a sanctuary of your presence and your peace. Draw near to her. We pray, bless her with a time of, of creativity and joy, a time of writing new songs and recording and, and blessing the church through her gifts. And Lord, we thank you so much for the news of the healing of Heather's mom. And we glorify you for that, Lord God. And we pray that you would continue to have your hand upon them, that, that the healing would be complete and there would be no, no coming back, no return of this virus. We glorify you, Lord God. We give you thanks and praise and all the glory. Lord, we see the hope in it that you are able to heal, that you are able to overcome, that you are able to answer our prayers and to do all things. And so we ask, Lord God, that in the fullness of your perfect time, when all your purposes have been accomplished, that you would sweep this virus away from our land and away from this world so that we could be restored to being close to one another, to drawing near to one another, even as we seek to draw near to you. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible is very clear that at the end of days, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. We're going to sing, Jesus shall take the highest honor. Jesus shall take the highest praise. It not, might not be happening now, but it will happen. And we can sing that together.
Take a seat, find your Bible. Adam is going to bring God's word to us this evening. Our scripture reading tonight is from Galatians. We're going to read Galatians chapter 3 and verses 1 to 9. Galatians chapter 3 verses 1 to 9 as we continue our, our series in Galatians. Galatians chapter 3 and verses 1 to 9. Excuse me. Galatians 3 verses 1 to 9. O oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scriptures, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed, along with Abraham, the man of faith. Let's pray together. Lord our God, we thank you for this, your word. We thank you for the, the gift and the blessing that it is. And we ask you, Lord our God, to open our hearts tonight. That you would speak to us. That you would change us. That we would leave this place tonight different from how we come. Draw us nearer, we, play, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? There is a, a school of thought which suggests that when you're, when you're preaching a sermon or making a speech, you should always start off with a big, startling, go get them statement. Well, it's not the only approach and, and, and maybe not even the best approach. But if you were going to go down that route, you could hardly go bigger or more startling than these words which open the third chapter of Paul's letter to the churches in Galatia. His opening statement here in chapter 3 raises all the questions. Who are these Galatians? Why are they foolish? 
who is bewitching them? And actually, what even does Paul mean by bewitching? Well, of course, the Galatians have a bit more inside information, a bit more understanding of what's going on. And by this point in the letter, actually, so do we. Paul calls the Galatians foolish because they had received the true gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel that that he and others shared with them. They had received it. They had believed it. They had trusted in Jesus. But now they are turning aside from that genuine and life-changing gospel, turning aside to put their confidence in the old spiritually bankrupt way of religious laws and rituals, giving up genuine hope and freedom for stifling servitude and inevitable failure. And this is such a tragically misguided move that Paul reckons no right-minded person who ever experienced the grace and love of Jesus would ever freely turn aside from it. So that if the Galatians are doing this, they must have been in some sense not only foolish, but, but bewitched, their minds twisted. And of course, we know who did the bewitching. Men who came up from Jerusalem, men who Paul refers to as the circumcision party, Jewish men who wanted the Galatian Christians to become Jewish proselytes. And the Galatians have fallen for it, fallen for it in a big way. And so Paul names them fools as he seeks their repentance. Now, you maybe find yourself thinking, well, this has nothing to do with me, right? I have, I have no interest in being circumcised. I have no interest in following Jewish rituals or, or submitting to the old code of blood sacrifice and ritual cleanliness. Actually, though, it is surprising just how much of a live issue this continues to be, even in our own days. In, in recent years, I've bumped into many Christians here and elsewhere, believers who have started experimenting with the idea of pursuing a more Jewish flavor of discipleship as if it would give them more authenticity and then insisting on worshiping not on a Sunday maybe, but over the Jewish Sabbath from sunset Friday night to sunset Saturday. Or according particular spiritual significance to the dates of Jewish rituals when the New Testament clearly says that we're fools to esteem one day over another. Or even suggesting that Christians should regulate their diet and their behavior according to Jewish ritual principles. The very thing, the very thing that we saw Peter so harshly criticized for in last week's text. Why is it, do you suppose, that Christians who have known that the freedom of Christ would find it tempting to turn aside from this beautiful freedom to the very constrictive Jewish legal code. To be honest, it's actually not really about the Jewish legal code. It's about where we want to find our righteousness. The gospel that Jesus had taught, the gospel that Paul had proclaimed, the gospel that the Galatians had accepted, says that we have no righteousness of our own. There is no wellspring of goodness hidden deep within our hearts. All that lies in my human heart is corruption. And all that lies in your human heart is likewise sin. The gospel says that in spite of this, we can still become righteous, but we must humble ourselves to accept the righteousness of Jesus. To accept his righteousness, not as something that we earn, but something that we receive as a free gift. The human heart, as it turns out, though, is not so good at humility. And so when we hear that we have no righteousness of our own, but we must humbly submit to Jesus if we want to have hope, even though we may recognize the truth of it, our experience, or at least my own experience, is that there remains a little rebellious corner of my heart that, that folds its hands and sulks 
that would rather not humble itself, that would rather raise itself up to greatness and so receive God's grace, not as a matter of grace, but as a matter of deserving it because of my own goodness. Does that seem monstrous? Terrible? Well, it is. But it's not just me. Oh, foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you? These words are a rhetorical body blow that make it clear, make it obvious that that the Galatians harbored that same rebellion in their hearts. Why were they turning to the Jewish law? Well, because, because they could feel good about themselves by making the big, bold sacrifices, by being circumcised. That's a holy thing. By not eating meat, by not drinking wine. These are showy, flashy acts of faith. By submitting to all the complicated and difficult constraints of the Hebrew ritual code. By feeling special, by doing special things. They could feel that they had become special. They could feel that they had done something worthy of God's love. Done something to deserve God's generosity. And so without really thinking about it. They transferred the basis of their hope from the blood of Jesus. To their own good deeds under the law. And there are many Christians today who are seduced by that very same temptation. Sometimes literally seduced by the temptation of old Jewish law. But but sometimes it's disguised in other forms. Sometimes it might be the temptation to work hard or to volunteer in order to become worthy, to be seen as good. The temptation maybe to make something of ourselves in the world in order to become worthy. The temptation to make sacrifices for family and loved ones in order to become worthy. The temptation to pursue a a disciplined, ascetic lifestyle, a bare and dry lifestyle to become worthy. The temptation even to use Christian ministry to become worthy. But all that is nonsense. All that is a bewitchment. None of these things can make us worthy. Only Jesus is worthy. Worthy the Lamb who was slain. And only by humbling ourselves, only by submitting our lives to Him, May we be wrapped in worthiness, wrapped in righteousness, not ours, but His. So Paul says to the Galatians in verse 2, Let me ask you only this. Only this, right? And uh, if you work through, let me ask you only this. And there follow five question marks. Question one. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Question two in verse three. Are you so foolish? Question three, still in verse three. Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Question four in verse four. Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? And question five in verses five and six. Does he who supplied the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith, just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness? Let me ask you only this, Paul says, and follows it up with five questions. And that seems, well, not only very like Paul, but maybe also a bit funny, Until you realize that these five questions that Paul asks are really one big question. Really one thing that he's asking the Galatians. And he asks it five ways to make sure they don't miss it. They have received the Holy Spirit. And Paul wants to know, did they receive the Holy Spirit by the grace of Jesus Christ? 
or because of their own good works and obeying the law. They didn't even know about the law when they received the Holy Spirit. And if they received the Spirit through their humility, covered by the grace of Jesus, rather than by their own proud good works, then isn't turning away from that path also turning away from the Spirit of God? Paul's five questions are rhetorical. The answers are obvious. Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Well, well, of course not. If the beginning of the righteousness of God has come to us by the gift of the Holy Spirit, it is in the gift of the Spirit alone that we hope for the fullness of it. Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Maybe a scientist beca can become a good scientist by working hard at science. Maybe a doctor can become a good doctor by working hard at medicine. Maybe a, a footballer can become a good footballer by working hard at football. But a Christian cannot become a good follower of Jesus by working hard at works of the law. We become good followers of Jesus by hearing him with faith. By drawing near to him. By depending on his goodness. Depending on his righteousness. Not, not walking our own path with pride as the world seeks to. But humbly following his lead. And then Paul offers an example, a shockingly unexpected example of grace over the law. Abraham. <laughs> Abraham, the first patriarch of the Jewish faith. Abraham, the first one to receive the covenant of circumcision in his body. Surely if anyone could claim to be saved by obedience, to be saved by circumcision, it would be Abraham. How can Paul dare to claim that Abraham, the father of the circumcision, that Abraham of all people required grace to be saved? Is he just reinventing the whole Jewish history to, to suit his own ideas? Well, no. Paul is simply reminding us of an Old Testament truth. An Old Testament truth that the Judaizers, the circumcision party who'd come up from Jerusalem, had forgotten. Way back in Genesis chapter 15, in fact, before Abraham is circumcised, in fact, while he's still called Abram, God speaks to him. And God makes these crazy promises to childless Abram. Look toward heaven, God says. Look toward heaven and, and number the stars if you are able to number them. So shall your offspring be. And two full chapters before his circumcision, in Genesis 15 verse 6, it says in black and white that, that Abraham heard all this and he believed the Lord. And the Lord counted it to him as righteousness. Maybe it seems like Abraham was saved by circumcision because he was the first to be circumcised. But Paul is calling our attention to this truth. Not even the first forefathers of the Hebrew people were saved by their obedience to the law. No. They humbled themselves before God. They trusted God. They heard Him speaking His impossible promises and they believed Him. And God looked on them. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Every one of them a moral mess. God looked on them blackened and compromised and distorted by sin and weakness 
just as we are. But believing, God looked at them in all their sin and compromise, looked on their simple believing and said, yes, I'm going to count that as righteousness. Oh, praise God for this eternal truth. Often, often, I've heard atheists say, maybe you've heard words like this too, that they could never be religious because how do you know which one is right? There's so many to choose from, right? They all claim to be right. Should I follow the teachings of Muhammad or the teachings of Buddha or the teachings of Guru Nanak Dev or Moses? Which one is right? Which one can I trust to make me righteous? God's answer is simply no. No. None of them will make you righteous. It's popular, I suppose, to believe that there's many different ways to the pinnacle of the mountain. But God says no. None of them will make you righteous. But God adds to this, none of them will make you righteous, but I will make you righteous. None of man's religions will make you righteous, but I, the living God, will make you righteous if you will simply believe my promise. If you will stop depending on your own wit your own energy, your own strength, your own wealth, your own power, your own religion, if you will humble yourself and let it all go and instead believe and simply trust that God will save you, then God will save you. God will apply the blood of Jesus Christ to the doorposts of your heart. I have heard others say, Christianity. Christianity is so exclusive. Can't be saved unless you happen to, to have the luck of being born in a Christian country or, or to a Christian family. And what about all those poor Hindus and Muslims and all the others who might never get to hear a Christian preacher? And, and yes, in one sense, it's true. Christianity is exclusive. As Peter put it in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, speaking of Jesus, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. But in another sense, in the sense that really counts, Christianity is not exclusive at all. Because actually, while it might matter to many religions, it doesn't matter to God at all where you were born or what kind of household you grew up in. Christianity is never inherited or culturally appropriated. It is a new thing that God does every time. A miracle fresh and new every time. And it is for anyone anywhere when they look at the majesty of God's good creation and wonder. And then the sordid wretchedness of their own heart. And cry out to God in any language their words of helpless need. I fall short. I am not good enough for all this astonishing beauty. Help me God. I need you. And when they believe. Whoever they are. Wherever they are when they believe that the one God to whom all creation bears witness will answer in power and salvation, when they believe, they are believing like Abraham in the name of Jesus Christ. This is not about what you are able or unable to do. It's not about where you were born or where you grew up. It's not about how religious your family was or what culture you lived in. You will not find the Spirit 
in your good works. You will not find the Spirit in your nation or in your culture. You will not find the Spirit in your family or even in religion. But believe God. Believe God and though you do nothing but fall down before Him and believe and cling to Him, He will count it to you as righteousness. And by the blood of Jesus Christ who has paid for your sins already. The Spirit of God will come to you. And heal you. Restore you. And change you. And make you not someone else, still you. But the bearer of Christ's glory. That he always meant for you to be. Paul puts it like this. Know that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Maybe you sang that song many, many years ago in Sunday school. Father Abraham, I'll sing it. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them and so are you. So let's all praise the Lord, right? Oh, I don't really have room here for the actions, but you know the song, right? And if you were astute as a youngster and you sang that song, you maybe wondered, am I really a son of Abraham? Maybe I don't have much Hebrew blood in me. So, so can I then sing that song? Can I sing of being a son of Abraham? Uh, maybe you're not a son at all. Maybe you're a daughter. And you find yourself thinking, can I sing that song? God's answer through Paul here is so clear. This isn't about you or the blood in your veins. This is about that fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. This is not about you, but about the gospel in verse 8. The gospel which God preached to Abraham beforehand saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. Not just the ones that carry your bloodlines, Abraham. All the nations. And then in verse 9, God says, Just believe. Believe as Abraham did and be blessed along with Abraham. A man of faith. I just had a thought. This isn't in my sermon. But as I was saying there about Abraham, I remembered that story that Jesus told about, about the rich man and Lazarus. And in that story, Jesus used a, a very beautiful and specific phrase to describe the heavenly glory. He talked about being in the bosom of Abraham. Why is it so good to be in the bosom of Abraham? Well, let me tell you. Abraham believed God and God counted it to him as righteousness. And so when Abraham died, God gathered him up into God's own embrace. And so if Abraham is in God's embrace, if you want to get into the bosom of Abraham, you have to snuggle in there. <laughs> between Abraham and the Father. And if you do that, you're in the Father's embrace too. I have a friend, uh, a brother minister, many of you know him, who is fitness mad. He's very, very strong. And he is very, very fit. And I found myself wondering, as I was thinking through this, wondering if, if one of my children say, we're in desperate danger, dangling over the edge of a cliff. And I had to choose. W would I send him, with all his fitness and muscles and strength, would I send him, 
Or would I go myself to save them? Well, objectively, I, I should send him, right? Because he, he can lift far more weight, far more safely than I can. But in the deepest part of my heart, I actually think in that situation, I would push him aside. And I would grab my child with my own hands. Not, not that I don't trust him, not that I don't think he can do it, but because I love them. And maybe love will dare what strength alone might question. But with God, with God we need not choose where to trust our salvation. We need not choose between love and strength. Because in Christ on the cross, surely we see love like no other. And as God raises him up from the dead by the Spirit, surely we see strength like no other. But here's the thing. We are not the ones reaching down out of our strength to save the dangling child from the cliff's edge. You and I, you and I, we are the dangling child in our sin and in our brokenness. We are the dangling child in that much danger and we lack the strength, we lack the righteousness to pull ourselves all the way back up. Sometimes we feel that, don't we? We might argue about it when everything's okay, but sometimes we just get to the end of ourselves. Sometimes we feel the yawning chasm beneath us. Sometimes we feel the looseness, the weakness of our grip. Sometimes we feel the failing strength of arms and sometimes we look down we look down at failure and brokenness and futility and we despair don't look down anymore look up for God is there he and He alone has the strength to raise you up. And He loves you. Loves you more than any other earthly father ever loved an earthly son. Look to the cross for the proof. Look to the cross of Jesus and believe that He wants to save you. He died to save you. Look to the empty tomb of Jesus and believe that He is strong enough to save you, strong enough to raise you up. Believe and become a blessed son of Abraham. Whatever blood flows in your veins, whatever gender marks your chromosomes, believe and God will count it to you as righteousness. Let's pray together. Lord our God, what can we say? First of all, Lord, as we think on these things, we, we name in the stillness of our hearts all the other things that we have tried to depend on, tried to rely on. Works of religion, impressive deeds, hard labors, cleverness. We think on all these things, Lord, and we recognize that none of them None of them harbored the hope that we need. Lord, we could pour ourselves out on these things, even to death, and it would get us nowhere. 
And yet, Lord, we have pursued them. Because in the pride of our hearts, we wanted to deserve what you have wanted to give us as a gift. And so, Lord, our God, in this moment, we repent of that. And we say, no more, Lord. No more are we going to pretend to be good or pretend to be deserving. But now we're just going to look to Jesus to see the love of God made flesh. Look to His resurrection and see the strength of God made manifest. And we are going to believe that this is for us. Lord, we think of that man who came to you, Jesus, uh, pleading for a miracle. And you asked him, do you believe? And he said, yes, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Oh, Lord, it is foolish, but we find ourselves there as well. We believe. We know these things to be true. But somehow our hearts want to drag us back to default settings. We believe, Lord, help our unbelief. Fix our eyes on Jesus. Lord, we pray that in the, in the days ahead, you would grant to us moments of encouragement where we, where we see the evidence of your love and of your strength. Show us, Lord. Let us hear your voice. Let us hear so that we may believe. And as we believe, Lord our God, would you forget all our sins and count it to us as righteousness so that like Jesus we may rise and draw near to you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If God has been speaking through you, through, through Adam, we're going to take some time just to pour out our hearts before him. We've got four songs we're going to do. The first two we know really well, and we're going to just yeah, use this time to talk to God, get right with God. And then we're going to do a new song, which is a new song. And then we'll finish up with My Hope is Built. On nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Let's take some time to come before God and yeah, get right before Him. i
Your grace is enough, more than I need. to do a new song this evening it's called we believe it's not that new it's from about 2014 we think it's um a newsboys song although there are a whole bunch of different versions because it includes part of the apostles creed um which is ancient mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not too tricky uh, you might recognize it um 
we've had it playing on um, Joy FM through through the church and things, so you might recognize it. Sing with us if you do. Otherwise, this is this is what we believe. our service this evening we're going to sing cornerstone my hope is built on nothing less than jesus blood and righteousness there is nothing else we need to do as adam was saying but believe Oh, 
Jesus, that is our prayer this evening. Lord Jesus, we thank you that our own salvation does not rest on what we need to do. Because we would never be able to do enough. We thank you that our hope can be in Jesus. Our hope can be in your perfect son who gave everything. And then he shouted, it is finished. It is done. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you that it is through your son that we can be made whole, we can be made pure, we can be made righteous. Amen. <laughs> 